Thank you, everyone, for coming to the um, Nutrition Biomarkers session. We're so excited to be back in person. Um, so for our session, we have a very exciting and informative session today looking at biomarkers and how they impact the description of nutritional status and also um, how that can be translated into clinical care. Um, there are two moderators, a slight change from the program. Julie Mattel was not able to make it, and um, Alex Wilson agreed to co-moderate with me, so she deserves an extra round of applause because she just found out yesterday that she was going to be up here. Um, uh, she is a dietitian who's a clinical researcher at National, Children, National Jewish Health. Uh, my name's Amanda Leonard, and I'm a pediatric dietitian at Johns Hopkins. So just a few... Um, Housekeeping items. We're going to have five speakers. Each one's going to be 15 minutes with eight minutes immediately following for questions. You'll notice there are no longer microphones, so you have to use the app for all question submissions. And in order to ask a question in the app, you need to be in the app in the session, and then there's a little Q&A at the bottom that you click, and it's pretty close to what we did when we were on Zoom, but now we just get to do it in person. And then the questions will come up to Alex and I, and we will ask the speakers. So hopefully you guys will have lots of questions. Um, we're going to start with our first speaker. Hua Ling is a statistical geneticist for the Center for Inherited Disease Research at Johns Hopkins University. And she's going to be talking about genetic modifiers and nutritional status. Let's see. Escape. Good morning, everyone. I'm Hua Ling from Johns Hopkins University. I'm very glad to be here to talk about genetic modifiers of nutritional status in CF are both unique to CF and also shared with the general population. I have nothing to disclose. So the first question is why do we conduct such a study? We all know that malnutrition or underweight has been a prevailing issue in persons with CF. Recently, as the treatment of the disease has been improved and longevity has increased, overweight and obesity starts to become an emerged issue. Currently, about one third of the person with CF are either overweight or obese. Normally, nutritional status is defined by BMI because of its close correlation with pulmonary function and ultimately survival. Therefore, CF Foundation recommends that uh, to maintain BMI greater than 50th percentile for persons with CF. It is known that BMI is primarily affected by CFTR function or the severity of CF. However, even in persons with similar or same CFTR function, we still see large variations in BMI. According to a twin and sibling study, which focused on pancre pancreatic insufficient individuals, the heritability of BMI is estimated to be 54 to 82%, which is still high. This indicates that even in person with classic pancreatic insufficient CF, the rest of the genome has substantial influence on nutritional status. Therefore, we, uh, we decide to look for genetic modifiers of nutritional status in CF. Um, so we conducted a genome-wide association study in more than 4,000 individuals that was collected by the CFGP. For those of you who haven't heard about this project, it was initiated in 2018 with the overall goals of identifying genetic modifiers of CF traits using a technology called deep whole genome sequencing, and at the same time, try to develop a protected resource for the research community. So the example of this project were collected from five cohorts recruited by three study groups as listed down here. Um, so, the, um, so most of the sample in this project were unrelated with a small proportion of twin and sibling collected by JHU. Some studies enrolled their participants based on a particular phenotype and others enrolled their patients by either random sampling or convenient sampling. Although most of the cohort were cross-sectional, the UW collected their samples longitudinally. Like many other multi-center projects, you expect to see difference in some of the baseline characteristics across different study sites. 
just like CF clinic monitor children's weight using BMI percentile um, throughout uh, childhood, we use a similar measurement called BMI Z-score, which account for growth using CDC population norm at different ages. First, longitudinal height and weight were ascertained from medical records or CF patient registry. To reduce possible bias associated with more frequent measurements taken during the time of sickness, we calculate per quarter average BMI Z-score for each subject using the CDC reference equation after adjustment of age and sex. Then we, then we took the average of all the per quarter average BMI Z-score and use that as our single outcome variable. Date were dropped if they were collected during the year of death, the year after <coughs> first organ transplantation or after first modulator use. The density plot on the right shows the distribution of average BMI Z-score for all the three study sites. As you can see, they were pretty normal with similar means but different with variance. The whole genome sequencing was conducted by the Broad Institute. After quality control, a total of 4,400 samples, including PI and PS, were included. Among these, 93% were pancreatic insufficiency. <coughs> Regarding genetic data, about 10 million SNPs past quality control with minor allele frequency greater than 0.5% were used for the GWARs. For single variant analysis, we modeled average BMI Z-score using linear mixed effect model with the fixed effects being study site, birth cohort, G-tube use, PIPS status, and the first four principal components. To account for relativeness among our samples, we constructed a genetic relationship matrix and used it as a random effect. Finally, we performed a polygenic risk score analysis using the same model. The score was derived from over 900 SNP that was associated with BMI from a large meta-analysis which was composed of over 700,000 European samples from general population. The score was calculated as log odds ratio weighted sum of risk allele, and then get normalized and scaled from zero to one. Here are the results from our non-model, which essentially is reflecting all the covariates that go into the GWARs except for the SNP, so that you can see what the important variables would be. For example, birth cohort, the beta is positive, which indicates that the more recent birth cohort you get into, the higher BMI Z-score you have. Likewise, pancreatic sufficient population has higher BMI Z-score than insufficient population by about 0.4. I want to talk about the G-tube use a little bit more because it was a highly associated covariate with a p-value of 10 to minus 136. On average, G-tube users has about 0.7 lower BMI Z-score than non-users. This is not surprising because low BMI is a clinical indicator for the placement of G-tube. On the right side, you can see the difference in BMI caused by G-tube use is almost consistent across all the three study groups. Here are the results from our single variant GWAR study. So each point is a SNP and the x-axis is the location of the SNP sorted by chromosome and position. The y-axis is a minus log 10 p-value. So the more extreme the p-value, the higher the value on the y-axis. The dashed line represents genome-wide significance level after Buffroni correction. As you can see here, in the analysis with both P and PS, there was only one locus reached genome-wide significance level, and the top SNP falls in a gene called FTO. Interestingly, after we limited our analysis to pancreatic insufficient individual, which actually reduced our sample size, the signal on chromosome 21 becomes more extreme and even exceeded the one on chromosome 16. And the leading SNP falls in a gene called IDNTS5. Then we run similar analysis by further break, breaking down pancreatic insufficient population into two groups, G-tube users and non-G-tube users. And uh, the results from the leading SNP at those two locus, loci were summarized in this table. The last four columns here listed uh, the beta value, which is the effect size, p-value, and the proportional variance explained by each of the variants. As you can see here, 
The variant in FTO is pretty common in CFGP with a minor allele frequency of 41%, while the variant in NTS5 is relatively rare with a frequency of 0.5%. Although having much higher frequency, the effect size of the FTO variant is much smaller than that of NTS5. However, the proportion of variants explained by these two variants is similar and modest. Both are below 1%. In order to see whether these two variants are also associated with BMI in non-CF population, we looked up these two genes in GWAS catalog, which is a public available accessible resource for GWAS and their findings. So the number in this table indicates the number of times each gene has been reported for in terms of association, study, and trait. The number in the parentheses are the count after we apply filter on trait labels using BMI-related terms as uh, listed here. So as you can see, FTO is a very well-studied gene and reported to be associated with BMI in general population. While NTS5 only has a couple of entries that are not much uh, uh, associated with BMI, and the, only uh, and the only trait that might be related is called BMI-adjusted waist circumference. So what is FTO? It's called fat mass and obesity associated gene with about 400 KB in size. It was the first GWAS identified obesity gene and also the locus, first locus that was unequivocally associated with adiposity. In general population, the risk allele of FTO increases BMI by about 0.4 kilogram per meter square. While in CFGP, every Every additional copy of the risk allele increases BMI Z score by 0.1, which is corresponding to about 0.2 to 0.5 kilogram per meter square in BM, for BMI. So this tells us that gene affecting BMI in general population can also play an important role in BMI for CF. So while Adam TS5 did not show any direct association with BMI in general population, plus the SNP is of low frequency in CFGP. So we looked up this um, SNP in public database like 1000 Genome and TOMAD, and it turned out that the SNP is relatively low frequency in European sample, but is quite common in African, with the allele frequency being 0.6 versus 18%. And this is about 30 times difference. And this observation is in line with what we later saw in CFGP. After we broke down pancreatic insufficient persons in, based on genotype of the leading SNP and ethnicity, uh, we saw that the number of carriers versus non-carriers is about 28 versus 4,000 in whites, 18 versus 100 in non-whites. And if you look at the average BMI Z score, it's almost equivalent between white and non-whites for the non-carriers. Overall, the carriers has about 0.5 to 0.6 lower BMI Z score than non-carriers for both ethnicity. We also checked the rest of the significant SNP as this locus in both CFGP and the 1000 genome and found that all those SNPs um, have similar minor allele frequency and effect size as the leading SNP. And in 1000 genome, all these SNPs are of low frequency in, Euro in European samples but common in African. So the local zoom plot here shows that all the rest of the significant SNP are in high linkage disequilibrium with the leading SNP RS162500, which means that these SNP along with the leading SNP were inherited as a group or together from generation to generation throughout human population history. So this suggests that the strong effect of this locus on BMI is likely driven by this particular haplotype that was originated from African. So although ADNTS5 is not directly associated with BMI in non-CF population, it was found to be highly expressed in adipose tissue. The figure here shows the bark gene expression data from GTAX, which is a public repository for tissue-specific gene expression. So as you can see, tissue with most abundant expression are adipose, breast tissue, fibroblast cell, cervix, ovary, uterine, and vagina. Furthermore, functional studies show that ADNTS5 knockout mice had reduced differentiation of precursor cells into mature adipocyte. 
had lower liver weight after 15 weeks of high-fat diet, tends to develop less white adipose tissue, but more browning of white adipose tissue after cold exposure. We already found a locus, FTO, with similar effect size as in general population. However, there are hundreds of such loci associated with BMI that cannot be picked up by our CFGP because of smaller sample size. We are thinking whether, as a group, um, there is a signal there. So we specifically tested a hypothesis, see if BMI loci in general population tend to show up in CF population as well. Therefore, we constructed a polygenic risk score using the data from general population after excluding FTO and then checked its correlation with BMI. It turned out that although not uh, strong, we do see a, correlation, a significant correlation with average BMI Z score in pancreatic insufficient individuals, suggesting that modest contribution from other loci to the variation in nutritional status. In summary, we found that some genetic modifiers of BMI in CF are shared with general population, including FTO. The strong association of LNTS5 in BMI is novel and is likely driven by a haplotype that is common in African populations. In addition, functional studies in mice suggest a possible role of LNTS5 in adipogenesis. Lastly, we think understanding genetic modifiers of BMI in CF can help identify the mactin and targets that are independent of F CFTR and contribute to the, either the undernutrition or, or obesity. For future directions, we will certainly continue to refine covariates such as GTube, which has a lot of granularity in the new data set. We will keep searching causal variant in LNTS5 locus and refine the signal um, at FTO. What we are really excited about is the possibility of incorporating modulator use in our analysis so that we can look for genetic modifiers of nutritional response to modulator use. Finally, I would like to thank CF Foundation for the use of their data and all the patients, care providers, and the clinic coordinators for their contribution to the patient registry. Thank you for your attention, and I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ling. That was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question while we're waiting for them to come in on the app. Um, do you see at some point that we might be able to use this clinically? Like, would be would be able to test for the um, predisposition to obesity in our population? Uh, I think it's very possible. Um, there are uh, still some study we need to do in order to elucidate the underlying mechanism, um, how this gene uh, may function in uh, lipid metabolism or nutritional, um, or the response to, um, to the nutritional um, uh, nutrition that were given to uh, CF population. And I think once we are more clear about the uh, mechanism, um, this gene can certainly serve as a nutrition biomarker. That's great. So we could maybe even tailor what our nutrition recommendations are based on genetic data. Genetic data. Yeah. Wow. That would be so exciting. Did anyone have any other questions or if you put it into the app and we're not getting it since this is our first time using it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, oh, I'm going to, and I'll say it in the microphone so the whole room can hear. Mm -hmm. So um, Dr. Alvarez's question was, do, did you look at different categories of BMI, like underweight, you know, sort of normal weight, overweight? Uh, that was a very good question, I think. <laughs> uh, we haven't done that. Um, but I think um, one reason is treat, uh, using all the samples in the study will give you the most power uh, to detect any signals. Um, of course, looking at the uh, BMI and at different uh, location of the distribution may help you to identify different mechanisms. Say, if you look at the um, two end of the distribution, it may help you identify additional signals based on uh, the underlying mechanism. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That was great. All right. Our next speaker um, had to travel quite a way to get here. Tamara Katz is a senior respiratory dietitian at Sydney Children's Hospital, and she's going to be talking to us about DEXA and should it be part of routine nutrition assessments in children with CF. Well, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our research today. Um, entitled, Should DEXA Form Part of Routine Nutrition Assessments in Children with Cystic Fibrosis? These are my disclosures. So by way of um, background, being able to accurately assess a child's nutritional status is extremely important because obviously it correlates really closely with prognosis. And the important physiological endpoint is what nutritional, benef what nutritional status confers a benefit to the patient and what attributes risk. And over time, the suggested nutrition assessment methods have changed to re reflect best evidence. So initially, we used percent of ideal body weight. And in 2008, Stallings et al. suggested that this be replaced by the BMI method as it more closely related to FEV1. And as the evidence base continues to evolve, it's now been suggested that perhaps BMI should be replaced by measures of body composition, such as fat-free mass, which may have an even stronger association with FEV1. This does make sense because the, in the general population, we know that fat-free mass is inversely associated with mortality. And additionally, it's likely to have a positive influence on respiratory musculature. So there are currently a lot of methods that we can use to assess body composition. Um, it's important to note that we don't actually have consensus over which is the best method to use in children with CF. The use of DEXA, however, is opportunistic um, as we already currently use that to assess bone mineral density. So the aims of this study were twofold. Firstly, um, we wanted to describe the changes in body composition with age and gender um, by using DEXA. And secondly, we wanted to compare the relationship between body compositions, body composition measures and lung function with that of BMI and lung function. So children attending Sydney Children's Hospital have routine DEXA scans every uh, two years from the age of 10 or earlier if clinically indicated. And since 2007, we've also been able to provide comprehensive body composition data um, along with our reports, which I know not every centre um, currently does. So for this study, we aim to include all children who had at least one DEXA scan between 2007 and 2020. They could be pancreatic sufficient or insufficient, However, if they were on a modulator at the time, we did not include the scan. BMI-Z scores were calculated using CDC 2000 reference data, and the fat-free mass and fat mass were taken from the DEXA reports and converted to indices by dividing in height in metres squared, and then the Z scores were derived by using the Wells reference population data. And lung function was um, represented by forced expiratory volume in one second. We used T tests for continuous variables and chi squared tests for categorical variables to look for differences, different differences um, between males and females at baseline, which was um, taken from their first DEXA scan. And repeated measures correlation analysis were performed to assess the association between FEV1% predicted and each type of Z-score, fat-free mass index, fat mass index, and BMI with FEV1, um, accounting for repeat observations in individuals. Uh, these were adjusted by age due to the confounding effect on lung function and stratified by gender. For analysis, uh, p-value less than 0 0.05 was considered as statistically significant. We had a total of 145 children with at least one DEXA scan during this period. Two were um, excluded because they didn't have reproducible lung function and six were excluded because they were on a modulator. 
So that left us with 137 children who contributed a total of 339 DEXA scans, uh, which was a median of two DEXA scans per child. So here we have um, demographic and clinical characteristics um, of the study population derived from each child's first DEXA scan. And you can see that the average BMI uh, centile uh, was 49.6. Um, you can also see that males had a significantly higher average fat-free mass index Z score than females, and females had a statistically higher uh, fat mass index than males. Um, but there were no differences um, that were significant in height, weight or BMI Z scores. On this chart, the red line indicates a Z score of zero and the blue line indicates the mean Z scores for BMI, fat mass index and fat free mass index. Um, as you can see, BMI and fat mass index scores decrease steadily with age, um, which was in contrast to the fat free mass index Z scores, which increased with age. However, as you can see, the fat-free mass index Z score in our population actually remained below zero across all ages. When we looked at the longitudinal changes by gender, <coughs> there were clear um, gender differences. Uh, males are represented by the orange line and females by the purple line. So male children had a lower average BMI than female children across all ages. Um, you can see that BMI peaked at around 12 years for males and it peaked at about 14 years for females before it started to steadily drop. Males had a higher average fat mass index than females until 14 and past that point, they were quite comparable. In male children, fat mass index increased steadily until it peaked at 12 and a half years and it then gradually dropped and levelled out. Female children had a fat mass index that decreased steadily until 12 and a half years and then increased and peaked at 14 years before levelling out. Female children had a higher average fat free mass index than males beyond, beyond 12 and a half years. Uh, male children demonstrated a slow rise in fat free mass index from 8 to 11 and a quarter years after which it plateaued and remained consistently around negative 0.75 until 18 years. In female children, fat-free mass index continued to increase as they age and it had not plateaued by 18 years of age. When we looked at the strength of the relationship between BMI and lung function and our measures of body composition and lung function, you can see that there is a weak but positive correlation of 0.14 between BMI Z scores and FEV1, and it was statistically significant. There was also a weak positive correlation of 0.25 between fat-free mass index and FEV1, um, and that was also statistically significant. However, there was a neg negligible correlation, negative correlation of minus 0.06 between fat mass index and FEV1 that is not statistically significant. The Pearson correlation coefficient suggests that while fat free mass index had a stronger association than BMI Z scores, both had a limited strength of association with FEV1, with R values being below 0.3. And there were no gender differences. So in our cohort, um, fat-free mass index Z scores remained below zero uh, for both boys and girls of all ages, highlighting that there are nutritional deficits that may be missed by the use of BMI alone. The use of DEXA here shows the pitfalls of assuming that a cohort with a mean BMI of close to the 50th percentile had normal nutritional status. However, the purpose of this study was to look at the utility of DEXA in the nutrition assessment of children using pulmonary function as our endpoint. And our finding was that both BMI and fat-free mass index were similar in their correlation with lung function. Furthermore, the correlation was weak, indicating that perhaps nutritional status 
while an important contributor to lung function, is only one of many influencing factors. The original BMI studies were done in 2000 and 2005, um, and at that stage, the median BMIs were in the 40s. Now, nearly two decades later, median BMIs are in their 60s. And during that period of time, we've also seen similar gains in lung function. So I might be saying something slightly controversial here, but is it possible that in modern day CF, the correlation between nutrition and lung function isn't as significant as it once was? It may be that we need new contemporary BMI cutoffs that define both risk and benefit. And we may see that this further changes with the use of modulators. Similarly, while we have uh, many body composition tools, we still need fat-free mass index cutoffs, uh, particularly for paediatrics, that align with pulmonary endpoints. At best, tools like DEXA can be used as a tracking measure and compared with normal reference data. And for select individuals, this may be an important tool uh, for clinical decision making. Lastly, the BMI goals were set back in 2008, um, only considered children with pancreatic insufficiency. And future studies looking at benchmarks for nutrition assessment um, should probably include pancreatic sufficient individuals as well. So in conclusion, Children with CF have notable gender-based differences when observing longitudinal changes in fat-free mass index, fat mass index, and BMI. And BMI Z scores and DEXA-derived fat-free mass index Z scores both had statistically significant yet similarly weak correlation with lung function. And based on these findings, there is little evidence to suggest the routine use of DEXA over BMI in the routine nutritional assessment of children with CF. Our study had some limitations and some strengths. Obviously, this is a single centre study. Um, our mean FEV1 was, um, was fairly good and our BMI centile was close to the 50th, indicating a fairly well-nourished population. We did not exclude patients who had liver disease or diabetes or who were pancreatic sufficient. We did this with the intention to assess DEXA as a tool to assess um, the whole, uh, a whole of clinic approach just as we would use BMI. Um, lastly, we know that puberty does influence body composition and unfortunately we do not have any TANA staging recorded uh, for these patients. So our observations on longitudinal changes were based on the typical age range of puberty in healthy children. We also had some strengths in that it was a large sample size. We had some repeated measures available, up to five scans for individuals. Um, so had some longitudinal data. And it was probably one of our last opportunities to collect this information on a modulator naive population, which I think is quite important. I'd like to acknowledge all the members of our team. Um, Jade Tran was a medical student who did most of the data collection. Katrina was a statistician who um, helped us with the statistics. And my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Keith Uwe, um, for um, helping with the conceptualisation of the study. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions in the app. Uh, so first, uh, given the limited correlations of nutritional variables with lung function, would you like to speculate as to the likely clinical outcomes we might be using to assess the importance of nutrition-related health? I think um while I've said that there's a limited correlation in the data set that we used, I definitely feel like um, body composition um, may still have a role. However, I, I feel like we need more relevant cutoffs, um, and by using more relevant cutoffs and understanding what fat free mass index in children is important to 
um, have a better pulmonary prognosis. Um, I think body composition still does have a role. It's just we have a, a long way to go. And if anyone out there has a DEXA data set that they would like to combine with mine, I think that would be really helpful so that the bigger the sample we get, um, I think the closer we can get to um, working out some of those um, teasing out some of those questions because we do have cutoffs in the adult population, um, but in the paediatric population, um, it's just still very much in its infancy. Great. And then a uh, second part to that question was, do you think this will still be lung function or another health outcome um, that will emerge as more relevant? I mean, I, it, it's... I think lung function is still going to take centre stage in terms of um, what is the most important uh, nutrition related outcome um, for kids with CF. Um, however, I think that um, while we have a uh, goal of BMI greater than the 50th centile, um, we don't yet have um, really good, and when I said at the beginning of my talk, we need to define um, our nutritional assessments based on what confers nutritional benefit, but also risk. We haven't really defined those nutritional risk um, upper limits yet of what, um, what BMI, um, and this is, I guess, important in the modulator era, what BMI is actually um, harmful to pulmonary outcomes as well. Um, so we're currently using, I guess, the general population cutoffs of above, you know, the 85th percentile for overweight. Um, however, it might be that in terms of um, not only pulmonary outcomes, but other outcomes such as chronic disease that, um, that occurs, you know, um, with longevity in CF, it might be that we just need to do some more work at, at establishing those upper limit BMI centile cutoffs as well. I hope I answered that question. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm very jet lagged. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, why was the data for those unmodulators excluded? Well, I mean, it was easy for us to exclude, exclude modulator data because we only had six patients during that time. We're a little bit behind in Australia. So um, up until 2020, we only had um, Ivacafta. I'm not sure, sorry, of the US um, name, if it's the same here, um, but for G551D. So we only had six kids, so it was easy to exclude them. Um, and, and I guess that's because we, um, we really wanted to study this based on a modulated naive population, um, uh, because that was important for us to, to um, work out nutritional risk based on um, uh, the untreated CF population. Thank you. And we do have another question. How would you propose centers start using fat-free mass index and fat-free um, and FMI more routinely in their practice in addition to DEXA? And then do you have any tips to start that process? So I think that's asking is whether I suggest that we should use body composition as part of our clinical practice. Correct. Yeah. Um, in paediatrics, I would say um, not yet. Um, because we don't have established cutoffs, uh, so it's hard to then, um, I guess, have a conversation with the patient about where they are in relation to where they th we think they should be. We can use normal reference ranges um, to have some sense of how they're going, but um, that's probably not going to be entirely relevant for pul pulmonary outcomes in CF. So. I wouldn't be using it as a clinical tool until we have um, really good data as to what are the important cutoffs. You can use it as a tracking measure, I guess, body composition as a tracking measure. Um, and I, th I think that just needs to be done with caution. Um, and it's really important how you communicate those results to children and families without causing um, other issues such as um, body, body body image concerns. So certainly at our centre, um, we're not using body composition, um, but I'm open to it as the evidence evolves. But I just feel like, like in unlike in the adult population, we're still in our in our infancy. Thank you. Um, another question through the app. 
Uh, what would the nutrition intervention be for patients with a normal BMI but depleted fat-free mass? Or would there be an intervention? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it would, th there would be an intervention if um, I was using it as a clinical tool. Um, I think it would be a joint intervention between your physiotherapist and your dietitian, as Susanna mentioned in the previous um, the previous talk, and um, it would probably be a, be a combination of exercises to um, increase muscle mass along with additional um, calories, and also I guess um, making sure that all your treatments. Um, to reduce the burden of disease are maximised as well. So if they need more regular tune-ups um, or if they need better pulmonary care or, or they need um, better GI involvement that you are considering all those aspects as well. Thank you. Um, last, we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, this one you touched on a little bit, but as the ri risk of obesity in the adult CF population increases, do you think the use of BMI may still help predict lung function or chronic comorbidity seen in non-CF adults with obesity, such as um, obstructive sleep apnea? So I think the I think what they're asking is, can we use BMI to predict things other other than uh, lung function? Uh, so what, like chronic disease? Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, it's an unknown really, isn't it? We, we don't have enough information about um, chronic disease risk in a modulated treated population, but you would assume that um, on, a, on someone particularly who might start on a modulator at a very young age um, and then therefore have less of the sequelae of um, cystic fibrosis, um, that there, I, I think that we would probably um, hypothesise that we would start to see that their risk um, aligns closer with the general population um, and what we know about um, BMI cutoffs and um, chronic disease. So I would, I would say probably yes, in time, that's probably what we're going to see. Last question. Um, is there any difference in the body composition? You're getting a lot of questions for your jet lag self today. <laughs> I didn't um, cover off enough, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, is there, no, it's just sparked a lot of um, thought. Uh, is there any difference in the body composition with different types of physical activity? I don't know that you guys looked at that. No, we didn't because, I mean, essentially this was a retrospective, retrospective study, so we didn't collect um, physical activity. Um, data. I mean, that would be something that would be fabulous to include in a prospective study. Um, and I feel one of the outcomes of um, this study was actually just a general conversation in our clinic about the utility of DEXA because we do it quite often. Um, and we've since decided probably to stop doing DEXA um, because we actually it doesn't generate an intervention beyond our standard practice um, in any case, which is if you have somebody with low bone mineral density, you optimise physical activity, um, calcium, vitamin D, which are all things that we do in any case. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. And a good job with all the questions. <laughs>
uh, with us. And so I'm hoping that if there are as many questions as Tamara had, she's going to help me out. Okay, my disclosures. So what's known about this subject? Dyslipidemias and essential fatty acid deficiencies have been described in people with CF using traditional lipid measures. The legacy CF diet um, emphasized high fat, high calories, really no specifics on the type of dietary fat. Um, you, you remember that the American Dietetic Association, or the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, excuse me, um, issued some guidelines. And in those guidelines, it was recommended a switch, a transition to a more Mediterranean type diet. Um, but th there are really uh, no data on that. However, in general populations, diets that are high in saturated fats are associated with hyperlipidemia and cardiovascular disease. What's not known? Does dietary intake in people with CF impact dyslipidemia and essential fatty acid deficiency? Do two different types of measurements, plasma measurement or red blood cell measurement, do they differ in their ability to detect essential fatty acid deficiencies? And do CFTR modulators impact these dyslipidemias and essential fatty acid deficiencies in people with CF? So the methods here, um, we had a collaboration between uh, a large pediatric CF center and an accredited reference laboratory with experience in fatty acid analysis. We were IRB approved for this study, and these were convenience blood samples that were drawn during routine CF clinical draws. So the kids would come in for their annual labs, and we'd um, approach them about being in this study. There were 24-hour diet recalls drawn at, or obtained at the time of the draw. Uh, anthropometric and clinical data were recorded. There were also 55 age match controlled who um, uh, donated blood samples. The sample collection for this study began uh, in September of 2019. Like so many other things in all of our lives, we had a pause for COVID from March of 2020 until 2021 in June. And then in July um, last year, we were able to resume our study. The demographics. There were 224 blood samples um, that were obtained from 162 subjects. So obviously some repeats on that, and we were glad for that. But 53% were female. Um, we had a wide range from about four months to 18 years, with a mean being at um, um, almost 10 years old. Uh, pancreatic insufficiency in 90%, glucose intolerance or diabetes in 14% of the uh, patients who were studied. Um, we had homozygous F508-DEL in about 53%. F508 DEL in and another uh, variant in about 44%. This was very consistent with the overall population in our center. The BMI Z score uh, was pretty normal at about 0 0.23. Uh, we did have a fairly good range on that from a negative 2.4 to 2.6. The modulator therapies. 69% of the samples were collected um, when the patients had been on modulator therapy for at least one month. 31% uh, were not on modulators, and then there's a breakdown of what uh, the different modulators were. 45% um, of patients currently on ETI previously had been on another modulator. So they'd been switched from one to the um, ETI. Okay, these are the laboratory analyses. The serum was separated, refrigerated for lipoprotein analysis. The plasma separated and frozen. The red blood cells washed, frozen uh, for fatty acid analysis. There was um, nuclear magnetic resonance lipoprotein assays uh, determined 
the particle number and size of the lipoprotein, direct measurements of triglyceride, total cholesterol, um, HDL, and then calculations of the LDL and VLDL cholesterol. Abnormalities uh, in fatty acids. In this slide, and these were in red blood cell levels or measurements for linoleic acid and DHA. And um, these are the uh, CF uh, population only for this. 11% um, of the red blood cell samples had uh, low omega-6 levels and 6% had low omega-3 DHA levels. When these same measurements were done using plasma samples, um, these differences were not seen, and then there were normal levels on over 95% of the plasma samples. The essential fatty acid uh, deficiency markers uh, for mead acid and the triene tetraene ratio. In this, um, in the red of the, are the high values, so indicating an essential fatty acid deficiency. 35% with RBC samples showed this deficiency, um, and 15% with the um, high mead, 15% uh, of the plasma samples. So a much less um, ability to detect these kinds of deficiencies. The biochemical findings and genotypes there were positive markers for essential fatty acid um, in the plasma or in the red blood cells for 48% of the patients who were homozygous for f 508 del Only 22%, still a high number, but 22% compared to 48% of the um, ones who were the compound heterozygotes. And this suggests a correlation between the biochemical phenotype and the genotype. Um, you've seen this uh, very colorful. I think it would be a lovely abstract art <laughs> painting. But um, this, this shows, uh, for those of you, the, the one or two of you who may not be familiar with this, the changes in different modulator therapy over the years from uh, 2014 to 2020 and how uh, this has complicated the kind of results. So very often we've seen people who've changed modulators, it's hard to compare from one time to the next um, over this. And I like the colors. Okay, lipoprotein abnormalities. So the, um, in this we have the CF patients who are in the kind of turquoise color and then in the uh, chartreuse color, I guess. Um, age match healthy controls. And we have a lower number of the anti atherogenic HDL um, particles um, as compared to controls in our CF patients. We have higher numbers of the atherogenic large VLDL particles compared to controls. And then a higher number um, of the small LDL particles compared to controls in CF patients. traditional lipids. Um, so here we're looking at the triglycerides, HDL, cholesterol, VL, DL, and LDL. And um, in this, 17% of patients with CF had high triglyceride levels. 24% of patients with CF had low HDL, or the protective um, cholesterol levels. So there are um, other things that, uh, with the LDL, 4% of patients with CF had high LDL, 16% had high VLDL levels. The lipoprotein abnormalities were very poorly correlated with diabetes, with dietary intake of protein and fat, or Z-scores, for weight, height, and BMI percentile for age. The non-fasting LDL, the large VLDL particle number, uh, triglycerides 
LDL and VLDL cholesterol were significantly higher in the pancreatic sufficient patients compared with the pancreatic insufficient, although the uh, total fat intakes were very similar. There was no correlation of the lipid parameters with genotype. No differences occurred between the pancreatic insufficient people with uh, CF who were homozygous compared to the compound heterozygous. And the only correlation that was found among lipid panels was determined by pancreatic sufficiency or insufficiency. The modulators were found to improve lipid and lipoprotein levels. Um, in this, the not on modulator group, so 61, this shows when it changes to the blue color um, what happens for children who receive modulators for a period of one month. And then um, the other color uh, for the age match controls. And they, with the modulators, children with CF were able to be somewhat equal to children without CF. And this held for um, the HDL particle number, the small LDL, um, triglycerides, cholesterol, um, VL and VD, VLDL cholesterol. So this was very fascinating. In summary, essential fatty acid deficiency and dyslipidemia are common but infrequently diagnosed in pediatric CF populations. I know that it's, um, it's true in a number of centers that they, you do check for essential fatty acid deficiencies, some more than others, um, in people with CF and homozygous F508-DEL, they may have a higher risk of developing essential fatty acid deficiency. People with CF who are pancreatic sufficient may have higher risk of dyslipidemias. Um, people who receive modulators, uh, whoops, I didn't, I really didn't touch it. You're just telling me I'm out of time. Okay. <laughs> the people with CF um, receiving modulators appear to have healthier lipid profiles and evaluation of lipids and fatty acids um, is not routinely done in people with CF, but may be indicated for our timely dietary interventions. For more information, we have a poster, uh, 225. Uh, Tanya is going to be presenting uh, Saturday morning um, micronutrient assessment update, and she's going to be talking more about the impact of genotype and novel therapies. Okay. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, I found that very interesting. And a question that is on the app is actually a similar question to what I had, which is, why do you think HDL improved after modulator therapy? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I really, I, I don't know um, if it's something, um, you know, within the Within the cells, um, I might ask Dr. Yusuf if she has some thoughts about that. Um, we were glad to see that it did. Exactly, yep. Um, but I don't know the, the mechanism. Okay. Um, thank you, Katie. And can you suggest a resource for interpreting fatty acid profiles? Well, um, you know, I, I look primarily at the triene tetraene ratio and look there. I look at the mead acids. Um, I, I rely, we're very fortunate to have ARUP uh, and I rely on them. I, I try not to get too caught up in a lot of the individual things. I look at the essential fatty acids, uh, you know, the, the linoleic, the DHA. Um, and look at those. I think it's important to follow these over time and to look at, you know, what's going on with the patient at the time that they are drawn. Um. Thank you. Um, 
Another one, actually, I'm going to put these two together. Uh, would you suggest adding essential fatty acid panels to our annual lab panels? And th that goes along with that is do you normally get a lipid panel or was it just for this study? Okay, I'm going to take the second part first. Um, at our study, or at our center rather, um, we have been um, utilizing the recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics for lipid screening. Um, and a number of years ago, they had recommended that there would be at least um, one lipid panel, a complete lipid panel, drawn um, for children uh, during, well, during childhood. Um, there is a more up-to-date, well, it's in up-to-date in the monograph online, and it's recommended that all children, CF or not, all children have two lipid panels done during childhood. It's recommended if you, if you have children who have risk factors, a family history, for example, that these lipid panels may need to be drawn as early as age two. Um, because of the familial history. For children who don't have those kind of risk factors, it's recommended that a uh, fasting lipid profile be drawn between the ages of 9 and 11. Um, you kind of skip over those teen years. Um, there's a lot going on, and hormonal mostly, but um, then it's rechecked at it somewhere between 17 to 21. Um, and so we uh, we had looked at this a number of years ago and said, you know, we have an opportunity because we do fasting blood levels starting at age 10 when we do an oral glucose tolerance test. So um, over many years, we have incorporated this into our screening and we will draw at least one, well, usually just once um, at their 10-year-old uh, oral glucose tolerance test. And then the second question about the essential fatty acid, um, I don't know if I'm ready to say to do it for everybody because, you know, it's kind of like that old story about the dog chasing the bus. You know, what are you going to do with it when you catch it? Um, and I feel that way about the essential fatty acids. What are we going to be able to do with it when we get it? Um, but I think that there are situations where you actually can use that information. I think you can look at your high risk patients. Um, we have uh, looked at patients who meet certain criteria, you know, for example, children who've had meconium ileus and have short gut, they're um, homozygous, um, they're failing to thrive. You know, there are those sorts of things that we, we, we really try to look at it. I think as time goes on and we get smarter about this, um, it would become more widespread. Thank you. A couple more questions. Okay. <laughs> Are there similar studies being done with the adult population, and how do you think the results of pediatrics compared to adults would be? Um, I am not aware of any um, similar studies being done. I think that uh, there's a great need for that. Um, next year, sure. Um, I, I think... Um, you know, there was a period of time with the CF Foundation where there was a lot of interest in fatty acids, you know, different things. Um, and we, we just haven't seen that. It, it kind of um, was eclipsed by some of the other features in research. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that there is a lot that needs to be done, a lot that is not known. So, okay. We have time for one, maybe two more. Okay. Um, are you, were you able to assess if intentional dietary changes resulted in altered lipid panels? Like, did you, did you have that data available? We did, we did have the data, and so if there was something that was markedly abnormal, um, we were notified by ARUP, and the families okay. were notified um, of that. Uh, were there actual dietary changes made? Eh. <laughs> I don't, you know, change is hard. Maybe not. Change is hard. Um, and, it, and it's particularly difficult and for everybody who works with pediatrics. Um, sometimes parents say, you know, I'm looking at what's right here in front of me today, right now. I don't know if I can worry about their geriatric nutrition issues. Yeah. So, 
Okay. Um, last question. Yes. Which team member, this might be a hard one, addresses abnormal lipid panels in clinic? We don't get them because our pulmonologists don't want to treat them. I do. Okay. The dietitian, the, the dietitian, yeah. I, but but it's always a collaborative process, um, and so I you know I think that's important. We've talked about it among the team, um, you know, and saying what do we need to do. We have at times referred to cardiology, because of some um, rather remarkable levels, and so we've had uh, teenagers who've been recommended to start on statins. Um, so, but, but it is a, very much a team effort. Um, all right, the last, last one, because you answered yes. that one quickly. Um, what would be an appropriate reason why essential fatty acid labs to be drawn along with lipid panels? The, you know, the essential fatty acid, I, again, I think we talked about risk factors, um, looking at it. I, I think when we draw them, we look, we're looking specifically at um, growth issues and growth failure. Okay. Um, you know, there are other things, you know, that we as dietitians particularly are taught to look at in terms of, you know, physical exam, dry skin, things like that. And um, sometimes that happens, but uh, I think it's the growth issues that we see most, that I see most commonly. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. Um, there were a few questions that we did not get to if we have time at the very end. Otherwise, we can ask the speakers with outstanding questions to hang around, and you can come up and do it the old-fashioned way. And thanks again, Katie, for a great presentation. Um, our next speaker, speaker is Dr. Jennifer Duong, who is a pediatric gastroenterology fellow at the University of Washington Seattle Children's Hospital. And she's going to be talking about alterations in fecal microbiota and bile acid abundances in the um, pediatric promise study. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jen. I'm a pediatric gastroenterology fellow at the University of Washington in Seattle Children's Hospital. And I'm ex very excited to share with you today um, our research within the lab, which is entitled The Fecal Microbiota with One Month of Alexa Cafter. Tezacaftor, and Ivacaftor in pediatric patients with cystic fibrosis. So today I'll be sharing the preliminary findings from the PROMISE pediatric study. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. So as a gastroenterologist, I'm really interested in the GI manifestations of cystic fibrosis, which cause significant morbidity and mortality for this patient population. These manifestations can be divided into three general categories, including pancreatic, gastrointestinal tract, and hepatobiliary. They cause significant disease burden, with greater than 85% of US patients suffering from exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, a prevalence of constipation in 41% of patients with cystic fibrosis, and in addition to this, CF-related di liver disease is the third leading cause of death. So because of this, it's incredibly critical for us to understand the causes of these GI manifestations, especially as patients are having prolonged, uh, improved pulmonary outcomes and are living longer lives. And so understanding the causes of these symptoms is the primary motivation for this research talk today. We know from previous work that fecal dysbiosis is present in patients with cystic fibrosis, and that compared to non-CF patients, patients with CF have a decrease in fecal microbial diversity, an increase in their Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes ratio, a reduction in Bacteroidetes, and in addition to this, they've been shown to have a higher abundance of pro-inflammatory microbiota, including those within Enterobacteriaceae, Streptococcus, and Vianella. In addition to this, they have a relative depletion of beneficial microbiota, including Bifidiobacterium and Clostridium. The reasons fecal dysbiosis exists in cystic fibrosis is multifold, and there's likely alterations in the CFGI tract that select for these altered microbiota. That likely includes thickened mucus, intestinal dysmotility, low intestinal pH, and on top of that, our patients are frequently exposed to antibiotics for their pulmonary exacerbations and are often on high-fat diets. This dysbiosis likely contributes to both gastrointestinal 
as well as extra-intestinal manifestations. However, for the purposes of my discussion today, we'll be focusing on intestinal inflammation, which is often measured via fecal calprotectin. Previous work in our lab has suggested a link between inflammation, fecal dysbiosis, and alterations in bile acids. In the bonus study, investigators characterized the CF fecal microbiota over the first year of life. And what they found is that when they compared to control infants, those with CF had alterations in bile acid abundances correlating with specific bacteria that are known to metabolize bile acids. And this makes sense because bile acids are important signaling molecules. They bind to key receptors, including the Farnesoid X receptor and the Takeda G protein coupled bile acid receptor 5, both of which are primarily activated by secondary bile acids. They have important downstream effects, including bile acid, glucose, and lipid metabolism, antimicrobial pathways, as well as having anti-inflammatory, anti-cholestatic, and anti-fibrotic effects. The microbiota has a key role in regulating bile acid homeostasis. As a reminder, bile acids are primarily synthesized in the liver, conjugated to glycine and taurine, and then are secreted into the proximal small intestine. 95% of them are reabsorbed in the distal small intestine and recycled in a process known as enterohepatic circulation. But 5% of bile acids enter the large intestinal lumen where they undergo microbial transformations, including deconjugation, which is done by bile salt hydroxylases. And so they undergo further enzymatic modifications by the microbiota to form secondary bile acids. So by modifying these bile acids, the gut microbiota can significantly impact receptor-based signaling as well as host metabolism. Dysbiosis and alteration in bile acid composition has been seen in other pro-inflammatory and metabolic diseases, including non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, inflammatory bowel disease, type 2 diabetes, as well as obesity. And it's characterized by a decreased abundance of firmicutes, a decrease in this bile salt hydroxylase activity, and an increase in the fecal primary to secondary bile acid ratio. So the purpose of my research is to explore the link between inflammation, fecal dysbiosis, and alterations in bile acids. Specifically, I'm hoping to understand the dynamics between these parameters before and after restoration of CFTR dysfunction with alexacaftor, tezacaftor, ipacaftor, or ETI. We hypothesize that fecal microbiota and bile acid content will differ between children of high versus low levels of calprotectin and that restoration of ETI, uh, um, CFTR function with ETI will decrease the fecal abundance of pro-inflammatory pathogens as well as primary bile acids and increase the fecal abundance of secondary bile acids. In order to do this, we'll be utilizing stool samples from the PROMISE study, which is a prospective multi-center observational study that's used to measure the effectiveness of ETI with people with the f 508 DAL mutation and to study the effects of ETI on various CF disease manifestations. 123 subjects have been enrolled for the pediatric study, and as mentioned, multiple organ systems will be studied, including airway, mucus, GI health, liver function, endocrine, and growth. But the purposes, for the purposes of today, I'll be focusing on GI health. So this is our study design. Um, so fecal samples are being collected from subjects before and after initiation of ETI over an ongoing two-year period. And at each of the following time points, we'll be measuring calprotectin, microbiota, and bile acid content. At this point, we have 254 samples collected from 94 subjects, with the remaining time points pending collection. For our methods, briefly, Fecal calprotectin requires an ELISA immunoassay. Characterization of the fecal microbiota involves um, shotgun metagenomic sequencing that's followed by metagenomic phylogenetic analysis using Metaflan 3. And then for the bioacids, um, this will be a targeted assay um, using liquid chromatography in tandem with mass spec. And this will be done at Northwest Metabolomics Research Center. 
So this is the progress we've made so far, with the majority of the samples having finished analysis for fecal calprotectin, as well as characterization of the microbiota. For today, I'll be sharing some preliminary results. Specifically, we looked at fecal samples from 70 subjects before and after one month of ETI. And we, and we made the following comparisons. We looked at fecal microbiota among children with the highest versus the lowest level of calprotectin at baseline, and then made comparisons among subjects at baseline and after one month of ETI. This is a summary of the 70 patients that we examined. Um, as you can see, the majority of these patients are males with a fairly even split in their F508 genotype. The first major observation we made is that the baseline fecal microbiota was highly variable between subjects. So I, what I have illustrated here is a stacked bar plot with each of the individual vertical bars representing single patient samples. Each of the colors represents a specific bacterial taxa, which I have shown here at the family level, and on the y-axis is relative abundance. So the purpose of this um, plot isn't to become overwhelmed by the colors or to um, see specific bacterial taxa on the right and left sides of the screen, but rather to note that there are varying proportions of each of these bacterial taxa for each of these individuals, suggesting that there's a high degree of intersubject variability, which is what we would expect in a fecal microbiota um, study and is fairly common. So given this high degree of intersubject variability, a large effect size or a large sample size is needed to detect significant changes in the microbiota. Our second observation is that when we compare the baseline microbiota between the samples at the highest level of calprotectin versus lows at the lowest level of calprotectin, we saw some significant differences. Those with the highest level of calprotectin had lower relative abundance of firmicutes. And so what I have illustrated here is a box plot with each of the dots individ uh, representing individual patient samples. The green dots represent the lowest level of calprotectin, whereas the olive dots represent the highest level of calprotectin, and on the y-axis is firmicutes relative abundance. In addition to this, those at the highest level of calprotectin also showed a higher relative abundance of proteobacteria that was primarily driven by Escherichia. These results confirm the observed relationship between dysbiosis and fecal inflammatory measures. We were then interested in seeing if there were changes in the microbiota among patients before and after one month of ETI. However, we did not see significant differences. What I have illustrated here is a principal coordinates analysis, or a PCOA plot, and the purpose of this plot is to graphically represent similarity or dissimilarity between populations, with points closer together suggesting similarity and those further apart suggesting dissimilarity. The bigger circle and square indicates the average microbiota, whereas the individual smaller circle and squares represent individual samples. And what you can see is that while the bigger points congregate quite closely together, the individual points are spread quite far apart um, and are dispersed throughout the plot, suggesting again that high level of intersubject variability. And you can see that both at the phylum level as well as the genus level. Finally, we were interested in seeing if there were changes in the fecal microbiota among children who had a decrease in their fecal calprotectin after ETI. We noted that of the 70 children we studied, 40 of them did have a decrease in their fecal calprotectin. And so what I have shown here are line plots with each of the individual lines representing uh, each of the 40 patient samples, um, x-axis indicating before and after ETI, and our y-axis indicating calprotectin. The red dotted lines denote the categories of calprotectin with greater than 120 being abnormal, 50 to 120 being borderline, and less than 50 being normal. Among the 70, eight of these children had an initially abnormal calprotectin that normalized after ETI. So we were interested in looking at the microbiota differences between these two. We found some non-significant trends, which included an increased relative abundance of firmicutes and a de decreased relative abundance of proteobacteria, which is what would have been consistent with our hypothesis. 
So in conclusion, we studied 70 patient pairs and found that the fecal microbiota did not change significantly after one month of ETI. Among the eight subjects that had a normalization of initially abnormal uh, calprotectin, we did see some non-significant trends, including an increase in the Firmicutes relative abundance and a decrease in their proteobacteria relative abundance. Again, these subjects had high intersubject variability, which we suspect mass any effects ETI may have had on the microbiota. In addition to this, we recognize that fecal calprotectin is an imperfect marker of intestinal inflammation, and a different biomarker may be more appropriate. Thus far, our results are consistent with the observations of a relatively small effect of ETI on the GI system as compared to the lung, at least at this very early time point. Limitations of our study include lack of control for the effects of antibiotic, diet, as well as other treatment changes. However, I argue that there's more to this story, and this is just an interim analysis. Our next steps include measurement of the fecal microbiota at the later time points, fecal calprotectin at later <coughs> time points. In addition to this, it'll be interesting to see what the bile acids are doing as well as the functional activity uh, via the bile salt hydroxylase genes. So I'd like to thank um, the following members, um, the promised PIs, um, including the patient and families um, who have been participating in this study. I'd like to thank Dr. Luke Hoffman, my research mentor, as well as other members of the Hoffman Lab, um, our collaborators at the Salaponte Lab and the Raftery Lab, my Seattle Children's Pediatric GI Division, um, as well as the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation for um, my funding. Now I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, the first question is, oh, it, um, excuse me, it moved around. Um, when analyzing the microbiota structure um, in people with CF pre and post ETI, did you account for antibiotic use? Yes, that's a great question. Um, as mentioned, one of our limitations of our study is that we weren't able to account for antibiotic use. That being said, we did exclude patients who had antibiotics um, in the 14 days prior to initiation of ETI. And the expectation is that um, with patients having improved pulmonary function with ETI, that hopefully the use of antibiotics for pulmonary exacerbations would go down. Um, but unfortunately, we're not able to specifically, yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you. Did the researchers take into consideration the diet composition of the patients or probiotic usage? Yeah, these are all excellent questions. Um, unfortunately, with these microbiome studies, sometimes it can be very challenging to account for both diet um, as well as other medication use. Um, and we recognize that as being a limitation um, to this study. Okay. Do you have any recommendations about pre or probiotics for those patients without modulators? to improve their microbiota? Um, I think it's a little bit early to say um, on pre or probiotics. I believe there have been some preliminary sort of pilot and um, smaller size studies that have suggested a potential improvement in probiotics. However, um, you know, because of the lack of FDA regulation, it's hard to rec recommend specific strains or specific types of probiotics. And so I think there's more data that needs to be collected before routine use of pre or pro uh, probiotics. Um, did you see a difference in bacterioids before and after ETI? I'm not sure, uh, bacteria, I'm not sure if that's. Bacteroides. Bacteroides. Oh, bacteroides. sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. Mm. I appreciate that. Um, and did the, uh, is there a normal range for calprotectin? in the CF population? Yes, um, so ideally calprotectin would be less than 50. Um, we already know at baseline that patients with CF have abnormal calprotectin, but for a healthy individual, um, that baseline would be less than 50. Okay. Um, and you mentioned in the, at the end that there might be, the, um, you might not be looking at the best 
biomarker to address inflammation? Do you know what might be a better option, or do you have a thought? Yeah, so the challenge with using calprotectin is that it's a marker of sort of neutrophil activation, and so it can be elevated not just in inflammation, but in infection, for instance. Um, and, and the other challenging thing with using calprotectin is that while we have reference ranges for older children, in younger children, um, it may not be the best marker. And so other markers that are being studied for inflammation in this study include um, intestinal fatty acid binding protein, which is a marker of enterocyte um, integrity and intestinal epithelial like barrier function. So that might be an interesting marker to use as well, and that's collected via the serum. In addition to this, um, like serum CRP is also being collected as part of this study. And then I think an interesting clinical correlate that um, we've seen go along with inflammation would be growth, uh, would be another interesting marker. All right. Um, the, and I'm just seeing now the comments that people are having a hard time hearing in the back. Is it better or should we adjust the microphone? I'm going to take no response as it's improved. And I apologize. There, oh, it's what? Oh, it's that microphone. OK. It's, there was a whole section that I didn't know was on the app. So I'm just trying to catch up. OK. So I think there was one more unanswered. Oh, wait. No, that was she typed it in the quick. Okay. Well, well, I have a question. Okay. Um, so, uh, knowing that promise has been going on with adults for since 2019, is there any way for you to have access to the adult data? That yeah. are almost there, two years, yeah, two and a yeah. half years post? Yeah, that's also an excellent question. So as, as part of the Hoffman Lab, we are also looking at the fecal microbiota data for the Promise adults. And so hopefully we'll have exciting information to share at our next big CF conference. Um, we have time for a few more questions that I just found in a separate section. Um, so were the genetics of those with decreased levels of fecal calprotectin analyzed to see if certain variants are associated with the changes? Um, we did not do that for this uh, specific study, but that would be um, really interesting to see if perhaps there's a difference with patients who are pancreatic insufficient versus um, sufficient if there's changes in the fecal microbiota. So certain um, genes related to that, I think, would be particularly interesting. OK, another question. Is there any pH data for microbiome that can help with this? Yeah, um, so not part of my study specifically, but part of the PROMISE study in the GI health portion, there will be looking at um, pH. And so it'll be interesting to see if there's an increase in intestinal pH and seeing whether that correlates with um, changes in the microbiota. Um, do you think that one month is long enough to see an ETI-related microbiota change? I think one month um, may not be enough time. Um, so based on some other studies, primarily um, Iva Kafter, uh, I think in the Arrival and the CLIMB study, both of these, they didn't necessarily look at microbiota, but they looked at other measures of GI function and showed that over time, GI function, specifically pancreatic in fun function, improved. So it's potential that with our later time points, we might see changes in the fecal microbiota. Um, the other thing I think would be really interesting is that you know even if we don't see changes in the microbiota themselves, maybe we'll see changes in the metabolites, which which is why the bile acid story is a very interesting one as well. It'll be really interesting to see the rest of the data. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Great job. Um, and we're down to our final speaker. Um, Dr. Sarah Lussman is Associate Professor of Pediatrics at CUMC and the Director of Pediatric GI Fellowship Training Program there. And she's also a Digest awardee. And she's going to talk about um, ETI and how it alters GI symptoms and inflammation. And uh, before you start, Dr. Lussman, it's, um, if you could put the questions, there's a question section and a discussion section. The discussion section is the one that's harder for us to track. So if you could click questions when you have the questions, it would be appreciated. Thank you. And sorry to anyone that we missed. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to the organizers uh, for that kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to uh, present some of the data from the Promise Peds GI sub-study. Uh, so today we'll be talking about how Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, and Ivacaftor alter GI symptoms and inflammation. I have no relevant relationships to disclose. 
so it is known uh, that GI disease affects growth and nutrition, pulmonary function, as well as wellness and quality of life for people with CF. And so therefore, recognizing and managing GI disease and CF is part of comprehensive care and something that we've seen over and over again is extremely important to patients and their families. Um, as we've heard, CFTR mutations are known to affect fluid secretion and intestinal pH, and this in turn contributes to inflammation, dysmotility, and dysbiosis in the CF intestine, causing GI symptoms. Uh, some of you may have seen the recent publication of the GALAXY study, which was a really comprehensive look at GI symptoms in children and adults with CF. Uh, this was just published um, in recent days, um, so I want to congratulate that team and refer you all to that study for further context um, for understanding the meaning of these results that I'm about to present. Okay, so Alexa Kafter, Teza Kafter, and Iva Kafter ETI is a CFTR corrector and potentiator which has been approved uh, for use in CF patients six and older who have at least one ETI responsive CFTR allele. And while CFTR modulator medic medications such as ETI have shown significant pulmonary benefit, their efficacy on gastrointestinal or GI outcomes is less clear. The PROMISE GI study, uh, which was conducted in participants 12 years and older, uh, demonstrated little to no change in GI symptoms, no change in fecal elastase, and some reduced intestinal inflammation in those participants after initiation of ETI therapy. The PROMISE PEDS substudy, which was conducted in children with CF from six up until 12 years of age, um, was, had the goal for ass assessing efficacy of ETI therapy in multiple realms. Um, and among those realms, we wanted to examine the GI disease and effects in children who initiated ETI through a combination of symptom questionnaires, specimen collection, and evaluation of potential biomarkers. This was designed as an observational prospective cohort study which was conducted at 20 U.S. centers through the CF Foundation Therapeutics Development Network. Children who were six um, up until 12 years old at the time of ETI initiation and who had at least one Delta F508 allele and were considered otherwise stable with regard to their clinical care were considered eligible. Um, so now I'm going to report on some of the changes in GI symptoms and inflammation um, comparing pre and post initiation of ETI. For the purposes of this study, all of the patients served as their own controls. Uh, the results that we have to date for presentation include um, baseline one and six month changes for patient reported outcome measures or PROMS, as well as the baseline and one month changes for the fecal biomarkers, which have been adjusted for sex at birth and prior use of modulators. Um, and I mentioned the GALAXY study earlier. These are some of the same patient reported outcome measures that were used in the GALAXY study, uh, which provides excellent consistency throughout the literature. For the purposes of PROMISE PEDS GI, um, the measures that were used were the patient assessment of gastrointestinal disorders symptom severity index, or the PAGI SIM, the patient assessment of constipation symptoms, or the PAC SIM, patient assessment of constipation symptoms as if, uh, related to quality of life, or the PAC QOL, as well as the Bristol stool scale of questionnaire related to stool frequency. And then in addition to the patient reported outcome measures, um, as we've heard, stool samples were collected at different time points and analyzed for calprotectin, elastase 1, and steatocrit. Here's some key demographic information about the study participants. Um, the mean age was 9.1 years. 57.7% of the patients enrolled in the study were male, and 95.5% identified as white, with 7.2% identifying as Hispanic or Latino. 40% of patients were naive to modulator use, so the initiation of ETI was their first exposure to CFTR modulators, and the remaining 60% had been on at least one prior modulator. For the pediatric substudy, the patient reported outcome measures were actually completed by the children's parents or guardians. Um, and this is showing the rates of completion um, for these patient reported outcome measures. Um, and we're reporting both fully and partially completed patient reported outcome measures, which were done electronically. 
Um, and you can see here um, that the completion rates were very high at baseline, um, almost 80% for all of the different measures that we looked at. And then the scores, um, the, sorry, the completion rates did decline a bit over the, the duration of the study um, to the high 60s and eventually by six months um, in the high 50s percentages for completion rates. So now I'll go through these me outcome measures one by one. Uh, so the PAGI sim was really designed um, and, and initially validated for use in patients with more upper GI symptoms um, such as GERD, dyspepsia, and gastroparesis. Um, and this measure yields a score which ranges for, uh, from zero, which means the absence of symptoms, up through five, which means very severe symptoms, in each of six domains. Um, and those are nausea and vomiting, postprandial fullness and early satiety, bloating, upper and lower abdominal pain, as well as reflux. And so what we're looking at here, and I know it's a little bit small, um, is the changes from baseline, with the baseline indicated by the red dotted line in the middle of each plot, um, the changes at one month, three months, and six months after initiation of ETI um, in terms of the total score, as well as each of the six domains. Um, and so remember, the higher the score, the more severe the, the symptoms. So if the score decreases or moves, or the dot, black dot moves to the left, that's indicating a decrease in symptom severity. If it moves to the right, it's indicating an increase. Uh, so I just want to call your attention to um, some of the more significant findings, and those were in the domains that are indicated by the arrows for postprandial fullness and bloating. You can see that there wasn't much change at one month. However, by three months and six months, there was at least a statistically significant change in those symptom scores. Also, if you look at the, um, the row above the arrows, that's the domain for nausea and vomiting. You can see that w at one month there was actually a significant increase, um, but the magnitude of that change decreased in the subsequent analyses. A subgroup analysis was also performed, um, and there was no significant difference when um, the patients were analyzed by prior modulator use or sex at birth. Uh, the next measure was the PAXIM, um, and this has a similar type of symptom score with zero being absent, and th in this case, four being very severe in each of three domains. Um, and again, the C stands for constipation, so these are all related to uh, constipation, abdominal symptoms, rectal symptoms, and stool, stool symptoms. Um, and here, the scores were actually very low at baseline for these, this measure, and there were no significant changes that were seen at one month, three months, or six months in any of these domains. And then the PAT-QOL, which looks at quality of life related to constipation, um, has a score of zero to four in each of four domains, physical discomfort, psychosocial discomfort, worries and concerns, and dissatisfaction. Um, and in this, um, for this measure, the baseline scores were very similar to what was seen in adults, and overall, there were no significant changes that we saw over time. The Bristol stool scale um, is a way to contextualize and standardize the reporting of stool consistency. Um, and it's very useful in clinical practice because patients often say that something is normal or they might describe being constipated or having diarrhea, but that can mean different things to different people. Um, so on this scale, uh, the types of stool consistency range from one, um, which is very hard, lumpy, constipated stool, up through seven, which is watery or liquid stool. Um, so patients were asked to report on their stool consistency as well as their frequency um, at baseline one month, three months, and six months. Um, and you can see here that the percentage of patients who reported a constipated bowel pattern did change um, from baseline 14.4% um, down to the single digits at one and three months, and then a little bit higher at six months, 7.2%. Um, in addition, the percentage of patients who reported having fewer than three bowel movements per week um, did decrease from 7.2% down to 1.2% at one and three months, and then increased again at six months to 5.8%. Calprotectin, as we've just heard, is a sensitive marker of intestinal inflammation. Um, there was overall a decrease in calprotectin from baseline uh, to one month. Um, we, there was also an analysis done to look at the mean age um, by classification of calprotectin as either normal, borderline, or abnormal um, between baseline and one month. 
Um, you can see here there is a slight increase in the mean age for the abnormal classification from 9.67 to 10.6 years, um, suggesting potentially a small magnitude or a trend um, towards more normalization of calprotectin in the younger patients. However, um, these numbers are still very, very close, and just at one month it's really too soon to draw any conclusions about that. Fecal elastase um, is an indirect measure of pancreatic exocrine function, um, and this was analyzed at baseline and at one month, um, and you can see that there was no significant change in fecal elastase at the one month time point compared to baseline, um, and no significant change with regard to the age distribution of these patients. And then finally, steatocrit, um, which indicates the portion of fat in the stool, um, did not change between baseline and one month. Data was also collected looking at liver enzymes, and it's important to note that this was not for the purpose of therapeutic monitoring, although this is something that we do for patients who are on ETI. Um, and there were no significant short-term changes in AST, ALT, or GGT. I'm showing here the, the figure for the GGT, but the AST and the ALT look very similar. Uh, so what can we conclude at this point? Um, so after three months of ETI, uh, the scores for postprandial fullness and bloating did decrease slightly. Um, after one month, the report of constipation decreased. Um, intestinal inflammation measured as fecal calprotectin did decrease, but fecal elastase 1 did not change, um, and liver enzymes did not change. The stool analysis is ongoing uh, to examine the six-month data, uh, but at this point we can speculate that, similar to the data that we've seen in adults, ETI in children may have less impact on GI symptoms and function than it does on lung function. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the co-investigators on the GI Promise sub-study, um, especially Fuang Vu, who took the lead on the statistical analysis and created the beautiful figures that you saw in this presentation, Steve Friedman, Sarah Jane Schwarzenberg, and Mike Narkowitz, as well as the Promise PEDS team, the 20 centers who enrolled and followed the participants in the pediatric sub-study, mm -hmm. uh, and then my colleague Nicole Green, um, who was my partner in interpreting this data and creating the slides in the poster. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. So a uh, question in the app is, um, were there any challenges associated using the adult um, PROMS um, patient reported outcomes in this pediatric group? Right. Um, so I think that there are always challenges when we, uh, for a couple of reasons, one in translating yeah. um, adults, um, adult data in, ad adults instruments for children, although they have been um, used pretty extensively in Galaxy, so we do think that they are good measures. Um, but you also have that added overlay of the parental interpretation of the child's symptoms and how um, the symptoms and the GI function are affecting that child's quality of life. And the perspective may be a little bit different, especially um, really at any age. Um, so that is a challenge. Thanks, that was a great presentation. Um, in clinic, we do see some GI changes when people start on ETI. Do you think that the Paggy Sim, Paggy Sim, if mm -hmm. I'm saying it correctly, yeah. is, it, is that really showing what's mm -hmm. going on, or is it just that it's not statistically significant? Right. So, you know, what we're seeing here is some statistical significance in those couple of domains, but it hasn't really been fully established what uh, numerical change is indicative of a clinical change that's really meaningful to patients. Um, there were some earlier studies done using these same instruments that suggested um, that maybe a change of 0.5 to 1 point on the symptom score might um, correlate with patients really feeling a, a, a treatment effect or really feeling some symptom relief. And a lot of what we were seeing was like 0.25 points. Um, so even when we have reached statistical significance, we may not be reaching something that's meaningful for patients. Right, yeah. Okay, uh, so you saw a significant difference in calprotectin, but not elastase, mm -hmm. post one month on ETI. Is there a difference in the type of inflammation these two assays are reading, mm -hmm. or what does this mean for the individual? Sure, so calprotectin is um, a marker that we use for intestinal inflammation. It's driven by neutrophil activity, so it's not necessarily specific to CF, although we often do see that it's elevated in CF, but it can also be elevated in other conditions like infection and inflammatory bowel disease. 
Um, and it can be, can, be, can be more specific for something like inflammatory bowel disease at much higher numbers in the several hundreds to thousands. Um, whereas the last taste is really looking at exocrine pancreatic function rather than inflammation. Um, and whether we've, we're really seeing any recovery of the, of the pancreatic function after ETI therapy, and it looks like, um, at least in this age group of six and up, that we're not seeing any significant change or recovery. Thank you. Um, have there been any medications which have shown to be particularly impactful in GI symptoms for CF patients that differ from the general pediatric population? So are there, are there meds that are more helpful mm -hmm. in CF than in the general population? Right. I think it's, it's really hard to say because there are so many things that are impacting GI symptoms um, in both children and adults. So there's pancreatic function, there's CFTR in the intestine and how that's in, uh, influencing fluid secretion, mucus. There's, as we've heard, the, the gut microbiota, as well as um, a lot of mental health psychiatric changes and potentially neurologic changes, both in enteric neurons, as well as the psychiatric overlay that can really amplify GI symptoms um, and influence the connection between the brain and the gut. Um, so there, we, I don't think we have really any one medication that I can endorse as being universally helpful. Um, but there is going to be just a little plug for the, the symposium on uh, functional and GI motility that's happening later in this conference um, that will, I think, shed light, more light on some of those available therapies. Um, I have to put on my glasses. Um, have you seen changes in elastase for patients on enzyme therapy after starting ETI? Uh, for example, changes in patient tolerance of one formulation of enzymes compared to another. Mm -hmm. um, I think nothing that's really been um, demonstrated consistently with large numbers of patients. I know mm -hmm. that we have um, heard you know, some anecdotal reports of especially bloating after ETI therapy and some patients responding to um, enzymes that have bicarbonate included in the, in the microspheres and, and some relief, but that's really anecdotal and we don't have the data to support switching large numbers of patients. Are you planning to do the same study with adults? Quite a bit of adults in my clinic experience GI symptoms after starting ETI. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the adults GI sub-study, some of those results have, um, have been out already, um, and then there is a longer term extension to follow, uh, follow those symptoms further. So. And I have one question. Mm -hmm. How often is calprotectin um, assessed clinically, or is it more yeah. just done in research, and then how is it used clinically? Right. So it can be useful clinically to compare patients to themselves. Um, so for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, it can correlate fairly well with inflammation activity, um, somewhat with mucosal healing, and it's a non-invasive way to track somebody's response to, to treatment. I think for, um, for CF, the data is a lot less clear um, than it is for something like inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it's also been used, um, again, in the general population. Um, sometimes as a little bit of a decision-making tool in addition to the big clinical picture, deciding whether someone needs a colonoscopy, for example, mm -hmm. okay. um, for evaluation of diarrhea. Um, but it's important to also use it with caution because sometimes um, insurance plans don't always want to cover it and it can be quite expensive and patients can end up with, um, with a big bill. So you need to be kind of judicious about how you're using it and the specific question you're trying to answer. We have another question. Um, do you see a trend in how age affects responsiveness to ETI as far as GI improvement goes? Right. So we, um, I don't have that so far. We so far the subgroup analysis was just um, based on prior modulator use in sex at birth. Um, so far, we don't see any big significant changes. Um, there are some uh, some of the earlier studies looking at Ivacaftor. Um, looked at the response and the change in elastase um, for different age groups, and there was um, a trend towards maybe more recovery of pancreatic function as evidenced by um, improving elastase in some of the infants and the, and the younger children, um, but not that we've seen in the six and over. That's it. Um, thank you very much. Thank right. you, Dr. Lister.